All right, let's start with a prayer, led by Ryland. Dear God in heaven, we're thankful for this day, we're thankful for everything, give us. We're thankful for the opportunity to learn um, your scripture, um, and Jesus, and we pray, amen. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts in the letter to the Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians and Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus and Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude and Revelation. God made water, space, and earth on day one. He also made light for day, cause there was none. He made the great blue skies above all on day two. On day three, the land, the grass, the trees, and the seas too. God made all creation, and behold, it was very good. On day four, he made the sun, the moon, and stars on high. On day five, he made the swimming things and creatures that fly. On day six, he made the land creatures and all creeping things. And it was very good when he made Adam and Eve. Six days God created and stopped on the seventh day. Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 3. Genesis 4. Genesis 5. Genesis 6 through 9. Genesis 10 and 11. Genesis 11. Genesis 12 through 15. Genesis 16. Genesis 17. Genesis 18 and 19. Genesis 20. Genesis 21 and 22. Genesis 23. Genesis 24. Genesis 25. Genesis 26. Genesis 27. Genesis 28, 8, 8. Genesis 29 through 33. Genesis 34. Genesis 35 through 36. Genesis 37. Genesis 38. Genesis 39 through 40. Genesis 41 through 50. Joseph rules in Egypt. Genesis 41 through 50. Genesis 3. Genesis 4. Genesis 22. Genesis 37. Joshua 6. Judges 6. Get to get in the fleece. Judges 6. Judges 7. Get again and his 300 warriors. Judges. Seven, Judges 13 through 16. First Samuel 17. 
First Kings three. First Kings seventeen. First Kings eighteen. Second Kings two. Elijah rides into the heavens. Second Kings two. Second Kings eighteen through nineteen. Hezekiah and the angel of the Lord versus Assyria. Second Kings eighteen through nineteen. Daniel three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace. Daniel 3, Daniel 6, Daniel in the lion's den. Daniel 6, Matthew 14, Jesus walks on water. Matthew 14, Luke 16, Lazarus in Hades. Luke 16, Luke 18, parable of the persistent widow. Luke 18, Luke 22. Judas betrays Jesus, Luke 22, Luke 23, the thief on the cross, Luke 23, Acts 9, Paul on the road to Damascus, Acts 9, Acts 17, Paul in the Areopagus, Acts 17, 1 Samuel 15, 22, 22, so Samuel said, as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. 1 Samuel 15, 22, 22. 1 Chronicles 15, 13. For because you did not do it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult him about the proper order. First Chronicles 15, 13, Psalm 19, 7 through 8. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Psalm 19, 7 through 8. Psalm 33, 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Psalm 33, 12. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46, 1. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs eleven fourteen, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Proverbs eleven fourteen, Proverbs fourteen twelve. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs fourteen twelve, Proverbs sixteen eighteen. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18. Proverbs 22, 3. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22, 3. Proverbs 22, 3. Proverbs 27, 5, open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Proverbs 27, 5, Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Proverbs 31, 30, Ecclesiastes 9.10 Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. 
Ecclesiastes 9.10, Isaiah 5.20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah 55.9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9, <coughs> Jeremiah 10, 23. O Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. Second, Tim, second, second Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Second Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Genesis 1, 24. Then God said, let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. Genesis 1, 24. Acts 17, 25. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all life breath and all things, Acts 17, 25, Hebrews 11, 3, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen made of things which are visible, Hebrews 11, 3. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Psalm 19, 1, Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. Get it, Thomas. Psalm 139, 14. I have a little trouble these days hitting those notes, aren't you, buddy? Romans 1, 24, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being under th by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Romans 1, 20, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Second Peter 1, 20 through 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter 1, 20 through 21. All right, be sure to do your Bible reading and your advanced Bible reader. What's God's plan for the home? Who's God wants you to marry? A faithful Christian. All right, good job.
It's certainly good to see everyone this evening. Let's go ahead and silence our cell phones or turn them off so that we not disrupt the worship service. Reminder, there are some books, magazines in the foyer. Uh, look these over. There are some very good reading material back there. Also, the tracks that are in the rack. Uh, make use of these. Give them to your friends, neighbors. Leave them in the doctor's office as you leave. They are very good uh, for spreading the gospel. Happy to announce that Corey Woods and Steve Rogers were married this past week. So congratulations to Corey and Steve. And we wish them well on their, their journey through life. Let's also remember the Prashnick family and the death of Rebecca's father. Uh, keep them in our prayers during this time. There is a youth devotional in the annex after the worship service. All those who are of that age group are invited to attend. <clears throat> April's great niece, Landry, is in a children's hospital in Memphis. They are not sure what's wrong with her. They think she had, may have meningitis. She's running a very high fever. Uh, April has asked that we keep Landry in our prayers. Also, April's parents were not able to be here today because they're both at home sick. So let's, let's remember them also. Uh, send them a card, call, whatever we can do to encourage them during this time because they're still trying to get used to being in a strange city in a strange house. Remember the rest of those on our prayer list. Keep them in our prayers. For our worship service this evening, Brother Brad Luce will have our opening prayer. Brother Holton Smith will lead our closing prayer of song service to be led by Brother Jeff Miller. Brother Dave Miller will be bringing our lesson. Let us pause for just a moment to prepare our minds for worship. Number 176. One hundred seventy six. Praise the Lord. Sing verses one, two, and four. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the height. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. 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 Praise the Lord, for he has spoken. Worlds his mighty voice obeyed. Laws which never shall be broken. For their guidance he hath made. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the God of our salvation. Hosts on high his power proclaim. Heaven and earth in all creation. Lord and magnify his name. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 For the opening prayer, we'll sing number 230. <clears throat> 230. Church is one foundation. Sing all three verses. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. 
She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one o'er all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses with every grace in due. Go with a scornful wonder, we see her soul oppressed. Her doctrine rent asunder by names and creeds distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, they cry, how long, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Now we're opening prayer. Let us all pray together. Almighty God, it is wonderful again to be able to come into your presence to worship you in spirit and in truth, to take ourselves away from the world for a short time, to come together to encourage one another and to lift up our songs of praise and devotion to you, to hear another message from your word, and Father, to, to pray for one another as well. We thank you, Father, for being so faithful uh, toward us, knowing that we are unfaithful creatures, and we struggle mightily with the weaknesses of our flesh, and we just thank you so much for the gift of your Son and his blood that washes us clean when we come to you in humble obedience. We uh, are mindful, Father, of those who couldn't come and be with us tonight. We ask for uh, your providence in their care, uh, for the doctors, the nurses, the family members, and others who are caring for them, and we are especially uh, mindful of Landry and in uh, the Memphis Hospital, please uh, care for her and uh, all the doctors and, and caretakers around her to find out what's going wrong and let everything be done according to your will. Father, we live in a nation that is uh, quite bent on doing evil for the most part, and we're just grateful, Father, that there's enough of a remnant that your wrath is being held at bay for the time being. We know from reading your word, Father, that, uh, that it can't persist in this state and that something has to give. Either, Father, we turn from those sins as a nation or your judgment will be upon us. And we just ask, Father, that no matter how things go, that we will persevere, that you will uh, protect us and seal us from what uh, goes on around us. Father, please care for all these wonderful children in our midst. Please help them to enjoy the age of innocence as long as possible. And help us around them, Father, to do what we can to encourage them, teach them, and show them the proper way through teaching and example. And when the time comes, Father, that they will make the right decision to put on Christ and become productive citizens. Please help us, Father, to uh, focus on the worship service here at hand and divorce our minds from worries of the world for this time to give you the honor and glory you deserve as our creator and sustainer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 48. Forty-eight. Sing verses 1 and 3, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O Thou of God and man, the Son. Thee will I honor. 
Song for the lesson, we number 525. <clears throat> if it's convenient, let's stand together for this song. 525. The Glory Land Way. Sing all three verses. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus saves you day. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in I'm in the glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wanderers, come home, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in and way heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way onward I go rejoicing in his love I'm in the glory land way soon I shall see him in that home above oh I'm in the glory land way I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way groweth clearer for I'm in the glory land way. You may be seated. You'll mark the invitation song, number 313. 313 will be the song after the lesson. We have been involved in a series on Christian evidences for some time. We spent several sessions looking at the existence of God, and then we moved to the question of whether the Bible is inspired, and then we turned to the matter of creation versus evolution. And we are on lesson uh, number 21 um, out of the whole series, and this is uh, a further discussion of evolution versus creation, and more specifically, the age of the earth. And remember why we would spend time with that, because the Bible speaks definitively and decisively on this matter. It is uh, the foundational plank, really, of the evolutionary theory. They think large amounts of time would be required in order for their theory to be true. And so we want to uh, look at what the Bible says on the matter and then draw some conclusions. Let me refresh you very quickly, just a working uh, definition of evolution, the idea that all living beings have come into existence gradually over millions and billions of years through gradual, small changes uh, through naturalistic processes. God was not involved. Theistic evolution is really a, a nonsensical concept. Either God created or he did not. So does the Bible accommodate the evolutionary view of origins? Does the Bible allow for millions and billions of years to be involved in creation? pointed out to you that uh, some Christians in the past have uh, tried to argue that Genesis chapter 1 is uh, figurative, it's uh, mythic, 
By that, they don't mean it's a myth in the sense of like a fairy tale. They simply mean it's a kind of literature, a kind of genre that is not intended to be taken literally. And therefore, it's really just um, antiquity's way of describing uh, uh, some event that has taken place. And some of our brethren have bought into that, I think, probably because they feel pressure to acknowledge and accept what they think the scientific community has proven. And so rather than discard the Bible, they want to compromise the text in hopes of hanging on to that while at the same time claiming that they accept the sophistication uh, that the scientific community alleges. But keep in mind at all times, I don't care how many millions and billions of years you want to postulate, the idea that evolution could occur in the sense of molecules to man is simply a nonsensical, ridiculous idea, and there's no evidence for it whatsoever. Neither the Bible nor science, true science, provide any proof uh, for evolution. You know, uh, growing up in the Lord's Church, but back in the 60s, being assaulted by the evolutionary uh, scheme taught freely throughout the school system there in, in Arizona, it kind of left uh, a Christian, you know, in a quandary. You know, as, okay, so we got evidence, evidence for evolution, we got evidence for the Bible, you know, which one is true, but that, that's, not, that's simply not true. There is no evidence for evolution, none. Consequently, all a person can do is misinterpret and misrepresent the evidence because the evidence is decisive. Notice that's the same with many, many things in life. That's the case with false religion. Is there any evidence that you go to the Bible and produce evidence that causes you to conclude water baptism's not essential to salvation. There's a lot of people that believe there is. Do they go to verses to try to prove that? Yes. Therefore being justified by faith, Romans 5.1. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes, John 3.16. Well, do those two pieces of evidence prove that water immersion is non-essential? No, they don't. And that's the case with every belief system. And think how many myths have been perpetrated in medical science. Used to think to bleed somebody was a, a medical scientific approach to, to ill health. So that's human beings. And the problem is they're drawing conclusions that are not warranted by the evidence. They're not gathering the evidence properly and drawing correct conclusions. Even as people throughout Bible history uh, did. So we were talking about whether the word day in Genesis 1 can include millions and billions of years. And we spent a lot of time on that and showed that no, those, uh, there are Hebrew words if you want longer periods of time, but that's, that's not one of them. And so biblically you cannot use uh, the Bible to advance that idea. Then we also concluded that there's a lot of scientific evidence that those days had to be normal days. For example, Plants and animals that depend upon each other to survive would have had to have been in existence, you know, <laughs> pretty quick together in order for both species to survive. And so I've been giving you examples of this. Remember, plants were uh, established, were created on day three of creation, birds on day five. Now, are we talking millions and billions of years separating these two creations? Well, if we are, and then you add another million, uh, several billion uh, for insects that weren't created until day six, now, now what do you have? But what about plants and insects that depend upon each other for pollination, that depend upon each other for survival? They have to exist together, logically. You would have to try to come up with some way that they could exist before they needed each other. And I assure you, they've not come up with such a thing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I can't remember if we already discussed it. Plants and animals that need each other in order to survive would have had to have come into existence close in time to each other. They most certainly could not have been separated by millions and billions of years. And there is abundant evidence for this. One of those pieces of evidence of which you could spend the rest of your life studying just this point, symbiosis. Here's a quick working definition. 
a close association, usually obligatory. I mean, it's absolutely necessary. It's mandated. An association of two or more plants or animals of different species that depend upon each other to survive. Each one gains benefits from the other, which shows that the days of Genesis 1 had to have been normal days. And the Bible is true. All right, let's move to this one. We looked at some insects and so forth, I believe, last week. What about sea creatures? They, uh, created on day five of creation. Are there sea creatures that depend upon each other for survival that could not have evolved over long periods of time before they finally had access to each other in order to uh, survive? And of course the answer to that is no. Their symbiotic connections are such that they had to coexist from the beginning. They were specifically designed to complement each other and let me give you a few examples. Take, for example, large fish like sharks that consume smaller fish on a regular basis and therefore get bits of food and parasites uh, in their teeth, around their teeth. And uh, these can produce disease. They can uh, build up a matter that can uh, affect their ability to eat. And so God designed biological toothbrushes. This could not have evolved. It had to have been designed that way. And there is a lot of this in the ocean, a lot of it. Species that clean the teeth of the larger predators. Take, for example, the oceanic white tip shark. Jacques Cousteau said of this particular shark that it is the most dangerous of all sharks, and it is. It is a brute. Competitive, fearless, opportunistic predator. It does not avoid trouble in favor of an easier meal. This shark is responsible for more fatal attacks on humans than all other shark species combined. That's a monster. It feeds on bony fishes, including lancefish, oarfish, barracuda, jacks, dolphinfish, marlin, tuna, mackerels, and even garbage. They've found all kinds of things inside of sharks. It will bite into schools of bony fishes, swim through schools of feeding tuna with wide open jaws, scooping up the tuna as they unknowingly swim into the shark's mouth. If other species of sharks are encountered, uh, they will become aggressive and they don't have any problem with uh, dominating those other sharks. Uh, they are in fact fearless. Now look at this uh, little species of fish. Nocrutes. Nocrutes. That's the scientific name. Pilot fish, the, the term that uh, is used popularly, frequently observed swimming into sharks' mouths to clean away food particles from beneath their teeth. Here is one, an oceanic white tipped shark on the bottom of the ocean, and you can see with your own eyes uh, these fish swimming in and out, and this crazy shark keeps his mouth open the whole time. Now come on, sharks don't do that. They are masters of chomping down. It's a little bit hard to see from where you are, but I assure you they're going in and out of that mouth. And look at, uh, look at how they nestle uh, near the shark. And he shows no interest in... Uh, having a quick, me a quick meal. And there will be whole schools of these um, nocrutties noc um, swimming with these, <laughs> with these sharks. It's like, you know, a neighborhood of friend friendship type situation. This, this looks unnatural. That's not what nature typically you would think would do. It's as if they were designed to function that way. Very rare that a shark would ever feed on a pilot fish. Here is uh, an issue of Science Magazine back in the 19th century. It seems that Nacratus acts as a guide for the sharks and that the latter in recognition of its services never pursue it. It is certain that the Nacratus, which we saw lived in perfect harmony with the sharks. They swam around them, sometimes leaned against them within the pectoral fin. 
pilot fish gets protection from predators. You know, the, see, nature is so interwoven, complex, sophisticated the way God created it. There's all kinds of interconnections that I'm confident humans will never sort them all out. When we just catch glimpses of these, we know there's got to be a lot more. The shark, in the meantime, is being... Um, given assistance in the removal of parasites. Did you know that they thought, well, let's, let's create some decals and put these on surfboards and stuff to try to see, to see if sharks will not attack surfers and stuff. And they've, they've had unbelievable success doing that. So humans trying to sort the situation out and, and come to all the right conclusion, but the point is it's, it's absolutely astounding. Herman Melville, you remember, wrote, um, what, Moby Dick? He wrote this poem. Sleek little pilot fish, azure and slim, how alert in attendance be from his saw pit of mouth, from his um, charnel of maw, they have nothing of harm to dread, but liquidly glide on his ghastly flank, or before his gorgonian head, or lurk in the port of serrated teeth, and white triple tiers of glittering gates, and there find, there find a haven when perils abroad an asylum in jaws of the fates? They are friends. Friendly they guide him to pray, yet never partake of the tree. This has been recognized now for a long time. Evolutionists have to do a lot of double talk to try to avoid what is clearly being implied by this evidence. And that suggests that they had to have been created in close proximity to each other. Are you aware of the fact that there are what scientists call cleaning stations in the oceans around the world, especially at reefs? These stations are located where fish and other marine life congregate to be cleaned. Several species of small reef fish are known uh, to invite larger fish to stop by at their cleaning stations. They don't understand the communication that's going on. But it obviously is. There's communication. The cleaner fish exist to clean other fish species by removing dead skin and uh, parasites. And uh, scientists can only theorize, as they do many times and many times make mistakes, that it's either the colors and or the body patterns that flag their purpose and the host fish attract the cleaner fish by performing uh, specific movements in order to attract them. Hey, I need a cleaning type thing. They really don't know. The cleaners include like cleaner shrimp, there's a species of shrimp, wrasses, remora, and gobies. There are several species that do this. They eat parasites directly from the skin of the host fish, even swimming into the mouth and gills of the fish to be clean. The clients swim away spick and span, the cleaners get an easy meal. It's part of God's symbiotic arrangement of the created order. Uh, look at these... Um, Creature, these fish with these different cleaners that uh, basically attach themselves and stay with them. Here's a, a hammerhead shark. Not a, a docile species by any mean. Infested with electro, uh, ectoparasites, and yet uh, here they are swimming. Uh, to, they go to the cleaner station, and uh, there these small swarms of individual cleaner fish uh, come out to perform their services, and incredibly, these small cleaner fish will safely clean large predatory fish that would otherwise eat such small fish, and they do eat the other ones, but not these. Here's a potato cod cleaned by two striped cleaner wrasses. Here is uh, uh, more cleaner wrasses that... Uh, are servicing a gold-spotted sweet lips in East Timor. This is in the ocean all over the world. They get, they think, virtually all their nutrition from this process. And so you take these and put them in an aquarium, put a cleaner fish in an aquarium, they die. You gotta have the relationship, the symbiotic relationship that God created during the, the week of creation. Orange spine unicorn fish being cleaned by a Hawaiian cleaner wrasse. There's one there, and here is a rock mover wrasse uh, getting its turn. 
This is a scorpion fish. Look at these Peterson shrimp, cleaning uh, shrimp. He opens his mouth, and it's like they're talking to him, like a dentist. You know, wider, wider. You ever had that said to you? And when you watch them, I mean, they're, they're going inside the mouth of this thing. What an ugly, ugly fish. But notice that God created it that way on purpose for, for uh, his camouflage and so forth. Going inside the mouth, not being concerned about being chomped on. Here's a tomato fish being cleaned by skunk cleaner shrimp. Inside the mouth. And it's like they clean all over. The gills, around the eyes, in the mouth. Absolutely astounding. Uh, here are some neon gobies that are removing parasites from a green moray, which is a ferocious uh, creature. Groups, uh, uh, large fish like groupers and snappers would otherwise treat such small fish as food. But again, both parties are gaining. The gobies get continual supply of food. As these bigger fish visit their cleaning stations, the bigger fish leave the cleaning stations healthier uh, than when they arrive. Look at this uh, moray eel. It has a wide mouth with large teeth for tearing flesh. That's their purpose. And they, in fact, have two sets, a second set that is able to thrust forward, grab the prey, and drag the prey deep down into its digestive system. This is a ferocious, mean, uh, mean fish that uh, can handle prey. They can grow to 10 feet long, and they live on fish and crustaceans. but not whenever the cleaner wrasses and the cleaner shrimp come to clean them up. You think there was ever maybe a convention of moray eels that said, look, uh, there's too many of us that are getting ill health. Some of us are dying from all these parasites and stuff. Let's all agree to not chop down on certain species that will clean us. And suppose that convention took place. Then you have these... these um, Rasses and shrimp, and they're meeting in their conventions, and they're saying, are you stupid? We will never go in the side of one of those mouths. Uh, you know, that makes more sense to me than evolution. <laughs> A lot of footage of this kind of thing on the Internet, if you want to look at it further. The evidence, see... Literally, the evidence for God and his created order is so great that no one could ever, ever look, ever exhaust examining that evidence. It's bound to tickle, right? It's bound to make you kind of, you do that at the dentist, right? Inexplicable trust had to be designed. They had to have been designed to function that way. They're programmed. They're not thinking these creatures are not sentient in the sense that they have any sort of intelligence that allows them, what the, when the Bible speaks of us being created in the image of God, they were not. So they do not possess any of those attributes and traits that distinguish us from the animal kingdom. That's another proof that evolution is not true. So all of this had to have been designed to function that way from the very beginning. You know, God equipped animals with uh, survival instinct. He made them to sink out, seek out the kind of food they need and the means to avoid or defend against predators. So why would any creature allow other species that would otherwise eat them to carry out cleaning and hygiene tasks without threat or harm? And what creature would risk subjecting itself uh, to such danger? Well, the only explanation is there's a divine creator. And he created these creatures to have interrelationships symbiotic relationships that show that they had to have been created by God and done so uh, within a short time of each other coming into existence. Now, let me show you one other relationship. This is a really, really odd one, and again, there are so many of these. 
just the ones that have been discovered are innumerable, and there's so many that haven't. The watchman goby, that's a fish, and the shrimp. Here's what happens. Uh, the shrimp, here's, a, here's the shrimp, here's the burrow, and uh, here's the goby fish. The shrimp digs and maintains a burrow in the sand to live in for both itself and the goby fish. The fish are able to warn this nearly blind shrimp when there's any sort of threat uh, to its existence. And so they ma maintain contact with each other. The shrimp uses its antennae, and the goby flicks the shrimp with its tail whenever it is alarmed and thinks that the shrimp might be uh, affected. The shrimp gets a warning of approaching danger. The goby gets a safe home and a place uh, to lay its eggs in the burrow. So here's, uh, imagine the people that have gone and filmed this in the ocean. Here's the shrimp keeping the burrow open. You know, after it's dug, it, it, the ocean will fill it back in, so he's constantly having to keep it open. And so he moves out away from the burrow to move the debris away and uh, ha has the danger of not finding his way back to the burrow because he's half blind. And so the goby guides him back to the burrow. Little touches. Notice he just the, bur the fish is just standing there. He's keeping his eyes open. He's the watchman, which is why they call him the watchman goby. Working together, two completely different species have no reason to be interconnected or uh, to do each other any favor, and yet they are pre-programmed, calibrated, and designed to function in such a way that they provide each other with survival necessities. The sophistication that is apparent in such creation screams an intelligent designer that is far above us. Whatever reasons God had for creating all the creatures on this planet, that's got to be one of the explanations, one of the reasons. As the psalmist said in Psalm 19, the created order shouts the glory of God. It points to it. It proves it. Demonstrates its existence. So they've apparently observed these relationships long enough to see what is going on and how much they depend upon each other. All right. When someone asks you, why in the world are you studying creatures of the sea in church on Sunday night in a sermon? Here's the answer. It proves the days of creation are literal. It proves that evolution is false. And notice we have clear scripture telling us to do this. We've already called attention to Romans 1. There are many others. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. What, through scripture? Certainly, but that's not what he's talking about. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So that's reason for us to look at this evidence and pass it on to people that we encounter. If their mind is operating logically, which it was designed to do, and they're not destroying that natural inclination by their own desires, evil desires, they can understand that the things that have been made prove that the God of the Bible exists and that the Bible itself is reliable. Look at Psalm 104. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you've made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures, innumerable living things, both small and great. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. See, this is going on all over the oceans, all over the world. Job 12, speak to the earth. It'll teach you. 
and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this, in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. We've just been taught tonight by some creatures that God himself designed and brought into existence. What about Psalm 95? The sea is his. He made it. He made it. Such a simple statement, but so profound when you consider the magnitude and the majesty of the oceans of the world. All pointing to the God of the Bible. All right, Lord willing, we'll continue uh, our study uh, in, in May <clears throat> and try to wind up some of our symbi discussion of symbiotic relationships and then proceed on with some other matters. But uh, the main point we're driving at here is evolution creation. Evolution is not a legitimate alternative Creation is the only logical, scientific, and biblical approach to making sense of the world around us. And all of them point us to God. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight, you either to become a Christian or as a Christian to come before the church, you have that opportunity. Let's stand and sing together. have an opportunity to take the Lord's Supper this morning. It has been prepared. You'll come to the front row and the, while we sing this next song, you'll be served. Number 208. Two hundred eight is midnight on Olive's brow. Sing the first three verses. Is midnight and on all is brown. The star is dim but lately shown. Tis midnight in the garden of the Suffering Savior, praise alone. Tis midnight, and from all remove the Savior wrestles lone with fears. Even that disciple whom he loved heeds not his master's grief and tears. Tis midnight and for others give the Sorrows we 
forsaken by you. We remember the teaching of the Hebrews writer where he says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, Hebrews 2.9. We've been given the privilege and opportunity to remember the Lord's death every first day of the week based on the commandment of the Lord himself, Matthew 26, 1 Corinthians 11. We have that opportunity now, and these emblems remind us of his death the bread reminding us of his body, that he came and took on flesh. We came a little lower than the angels, as that text said, so that he could die for us. And the fruit of the vine representing his blood, so that he could offer that on our part, so that we could have that forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and wonderful name. Father, we especially thank Thee for the sacrifice of Christ, for His death on our part. And Father, also we thank Thee for this reminder, this memorial that You've given to us that we can think on His death. We thank You, Father, for this bread representing His body. And Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great name. We thank thee, Father, for the blood of Christ. Sacrificed for us for the remission of sins. Sacrificed so that we could be washed continually from our sins as we walk in the light. Sacrificed for us because we needed it. And Father, we thank thee for this reminder of the fruit of the vine that you've given to us that we can partake of each first day of the week and should to be reminded of his death on our part. Father, it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. as mentioned this morning, when you think about the Lord's Supper, it's hard not to think about the spiritual blessings we've been afforded in Christ. But then in the next act of worship, the giving of our means, it's hard not to think about the physical blessings we've been afforded because of our great loving God and creator and the giver of every good and perfect gift. We have that privilege and opportunity now to lay by in store. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and wonderful name. We thank thee, Father, for all that you've given to us. We know that we have every good thing because of your grace and kindness and mercy. We pray that you would help each of us as we strive to be the stewards of those things that we should be and to bring glory to thy name and how we live and how we use thy blessings. And Father, it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. leave the tray up here. Closing song will be number 456.
If it's convenient, let's stand together for this song, 456, No Tears in Heaven. Sing the first two verses. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness, all will be gladness, when we shall join that happy band. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears up there, no tears in heaven will be known. Glory is waiting, waiting up yonder, where we shall spend an endless day. There with our Savior we'll be forever, where no more sorrow can dismay. No tears, no tears up there, sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, no tears in heaven will be known. Let us pray. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, how be thy great and holy name. We thank you for this one other opportunity to come learn about your word, Lord. We thank you for the both lessons today, Lord, as we can take those lessons today and apply it to our lives, Lord. We ask you to be the people in our sick list and ask the people who are not here today, Lord, to come back to us soon, Lord. Thanks for all the things you do for us. Thanks for letting Jesus die on the cross for our sins. In his name, amen. <laughs> 